going to begin this hour in New Jersey in the trial of former Olympic equestrian Michael Barrasone. The defendant is accused of shooting Lauren Kanarik and attempting to shoot her fiancé, Robert Goodwin, back in 2019. According to police, Barrasone shot Kanarik twice at his equestrian farm following a long-standing landlord-tenant dispute. Court TV legal correspondent Chanley Painter has more on this case. Former Olympic competitor in the equestrian sport of dressage is standing trial for shooting his student and firing at her fiance. Michael Barrasone faces two counts of attempted murder. As prosecutors say, he shot his trainee, Lauren Canarek, twice in the chest and attempted to shoot her fiance, Rob Goodman, in August 2019. I guess she just got around the bush and uh, within four feet, that's when Michael raised up the gun and shot her twice. I heard him say, you know, I don't want a war. How do I fix this? How, how, how can I make this all better? At the time of the shooting, Canarac and Goodman lived in the home on Barrisone's farm while Canarac trained with Barrisone in dressage. But in the weeks leading up to the shooting, Barrisone and the couple allegedly started quarreling over landlord-tenant related issues and the relationship allegedly deteriorated to psychological warfare and violence. Prosecutors argue Barrisone intended to kill Canarac and Goodman by borrowing a gun several days before the shootings. I think he does pose a continuing danger, perhaps to himself as well, but certainly to the victims here. The defense argues Barrisone feared for his life as Canarac and Goodman mentally tortured him for months and then on the day of the shooting beat him and had their dog attack him. It was very life-changing incident and unfortunately I will never forget or get over. Barrisone says he called the police several times to report the couple but claims the police did nothing. If convicted of attempted murder, Barrisone faces up to life in prison. Now, since this is an attempted murder case, the victims have actually testified in the trial. The state called shooting victim Lauren Kanarek, and Kanarek and her fiancé lived on Barrisone's property as she trained under him as a dressage rider. On the stand, she testified that after a conflict, Barrisone shows up with a gun and shoots her in the chest. What did you hear him say? I heard him say... Um, mostly speaking to Rob at that point. Um, you know, I don't want a war. How do I fix this? How, how, how can I make this all better? Was he yelling? No. You know, Michael had been calling the police on us for reasons that we didn't even know why. And not this that it was out of character um, for him to act one way one day and then, you know, be nice the next day. But I kind of wanted to know, so I walked over to him and said, you know, how do you plan to make this better? How do you, you know, you have a, a bill or some, I was saying something about the bill that he had to settle with Rob, but I didn't get that far because... Why not? The minute I started talking, pretty much, or, yeah, within the minute I started talking, he pulled out a gun and shot me once, twice, directly in the chest. Now, the defense in the case is claiming that Barrisone acted in self-defense, but they're also putting forth an insanity defense, claiming Barrisone was pushed over the edge by years of abuse at the hands of Canarick and Goodwin. Now, police say there were multiple calls of landlord and tenant-related issues over the months leading to the incident, and during cross-examination, Barrisone's defense elicited testimony from the victims stating they were out to ruin Barrisone's business and to finish him. Did you make a physical threat against Michael Barrison? I do not recall. I do not recall. Specifically? Did you communicate this issue and problem to Lauren Canarac on that day? I'm sure I may have spoke about her horses not being shot that day. Well, That's a possibility. When you say it's a possibility, doesn't your text directly address that issue with Lauren Canarac? I see the text. I do not specifically remember the text or sending the text on that day. But I can see it's there. And during that discussion, 
Did Lauren Cantorite tell you to finish the bastard? Meaning Michael Barrison. Objection. You indicated uh, at some point in time with your relationship with Michael Barrison, uh, you decided or set out to try to destroy him, correct? At some point, I'm sure I mentioned that or said that. You, uh, you, you wanted to ruin his business, correct? Finally, yeah, that was in my mind. And uh, you, you wanted to uh, ruin and destroy his girlfriend, Mary Haskins, correct? I guess, yeah, after what they were doing to us, that thought had crossed my mind also, yes. Okay, now, when you say what they were doing to you, the problem, and correct me if I'm wrong, on direct examination, uh, where things started to deteriorate is when uh, you weren't being trained by Michael Barrison, correct? I wouldn't say that. Some things were deteriorating. It was part of it, but not the entire. What, what were some of the other parts? Just things here and there. Lot, small lies being told. Um, bullying. Uh, when you say bullying, what, what exactly do you mean? I mean Who bullied you? On one occasion, Michael jumped out at me in the dark, started screaming at me and spitting in my face. And at that moment, I didn't know whether he was going to try to hurt me or, I don't know, do something to me. All right. I want to bring in my guest for this hour, criminal defense attorney, Laura Yaretzian. Laura, great to see you again. Thanks for being on the show. Good to see you, too. All right. So let's start off by talking about these two victims. Uh, you have Robert Goodwin. You have Lauren Canerac. Uh, I want to get your, your take on how they did on the stand. For me, I think they both were somewhat credible, but I think they came off as being people who were just as involved in this mess as, as the defendant. Right. They don't come across as very sympathetic victims. Uh, that's pretty clear. And it's not just what they've said. For example, Kanarak is actually admitting uh, you know, some of the issues that they were having and how she wanted to destroy Barrison and his um, girlfriend and 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 uh, Goodwin kind of, you know, admitting, even if he doesn't admit it, it was pretty clear that there were some threats going on here from their side. So there's also the way they were talking and behaving on the stand. Um, Canara couldn't even keep good eye contact. A lot of times she was looking down or closing her eyes. And to me, that's a sure tale of somebody who's thinking and possibly lying or is very uncomfortable. And the jury is going to pick up on that. Yeah. And Goodwin had an attitude and that attitude is not going to help much for him. Yes. And I think you, you sort of nailed both of my issues with them. I thought her, her physical movements, that's Lauren Canerac, definitely belied that she was maybe not being as honest as she could have been. She was telling a story. And then for Goodwin, just his whole posture, just look at him there and his, his attitude, he, he just came off as someone that you would think could be uh, doing all the things that the defense says he was doing. And, and so my question for you is now this whole thing for me just became a big mess after their testimony. I didn't think the cross-examination was as effective as it could have been. I thought he didn't control the witnesses very well, gave them a lot of opportunity for open-ended answers, which can be problematic. But I don't think it hurt him that much. But at the end of the day, this whole thing, again, as I said, seems like a mess. Where do you think that leaves this case as far as the defendant and being found guilty? Well, for his sake, I would say even if it gets him a mistrial where the jury can't decide, they, they don't have a unanimous vote, that would be great. Or an acquittal. I would hope that he gets an acquittal just based on what I've seen. Again, I, jurors can can see through witnesses and they can see when a witness is lying. And I would hope that they can see that because that's the way I felt towards these two witnesses, putting aside how the defense attorney did, whether he could have done better or not. I'm hoping they could see uh, that these two are not being very honest. And if there's a bully here, it's possible that it's the two bullies are the two so-called victims. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, the other thing about this case, and I've been checking in with all of our guests regarding this, this dual defense, the self-defense 
and the insanity defense. They're required in New Jersey to try those two things together. Up until about two, 2013, they, they were bifurcated. You would actually try the insanity first, then the self-defense if you weren't successful on the insanity. But then uh, the, the New Jersey Supreme Court said there's no right to bifurcated trials. You'll do them together. Your sense on that and that approach by the defense? Uh, I guess, I mean, now that they can't bifurcate the two, so they have to present both, why not? If they can, all they have to do is create, number one, reasonable doubt, right? If they can create that reasonable doubt, he's going to get acquitted. And if they've got two different ways of doing it, they've got to do both. They can't, I mean, look at him. You look at him, you can see that he's a mess. And a jury, maybe, maybe, might buy the insanity of defense. That's a tough one to prove, but at least it'll give the jury the possibility of finding a reasonable doubt or maybe even nullifying. You never know. So I don't think it's going to hurt. You know, and as you I said, think it helps the defense. Yeah, and I agree with you. And, and you know, when you look at him, um, that was going to be my next question. What do you make of the way he looks? He, he cries at various times during court. He absolutely looks crazy. Again, there are certain people online, again, who believe he might be playing it up. It's all part of their insanity defense. But if it is, it's, I'll tell you what, Lara, he's doing a very, very good job at it. What do you make of, of how he looks and whether that might be a tactic or do you think he's just lost it? You know, he looks the part and the jury's going to have to decide. The jury's watching him all day long and they're going to watch him throughout the trial. And if and if it's just not him looking the part of it, I mean, he, I, I'm hoping that they're going to be able to get a good read on him and see how he is throughout the day. It's hard to put up an act all day long, all week long or for several weeks. The jury's going to be able to see through it. But I, I mean, it. it and there's got to be more than just the way he looks. I'm sure the defense is going to have to present more than that. And maybe the jury's going to have enough. But again, the insanity part is not an easy one to prove. I'm hoping that they can prove or show some kind of, they don't have to prove it, but they can. Sh there's some reasonable doubt at least created by everything that the, that the defense is presenting. Yeah, and the defense promised in opening statements they're going to bring in a psychiatrist and a psychologist to help the jury understand that uh, dichotomy between the self-defense and the insanity defense. One of the other interesting aspects in this case, Laura, involves recordings and the law for recording other people. I know it's in, in, in California, I believe it's a two-party state. Well, New Jersey's a one party state. I want to listen to some sound here from Robert Goodwin talking about some of the recordings that he set up and made for ju just for the whole dispute that they were going through. Let's take a listen. And at any point in time, did the prosecutor ask for that proof of purchase in, when he discussed this case with you? I don't believe so. Now, whose idea was it to purchase those recorders? I don't recall. Um, we agree with me that they were purchased for a specific reason. I mean, yes. Uh, you had discussions with Lauren and her father with regards to putting a tape recorder in certain places to record conversations, correct? I don't recall the specifics. Well, who was in charge of these recorders? You or Lauren? I was. You were the one that physically put the recorders in whatever place they were in, correct? In her locker at the barn. Is it your sworn testimony that the only place you ever recorded a conversation was from Lauren's locker? The only place I placed the device is Lauren's locker. And where else did you record conversations? In my house, my truck, in my pocket. Did you ever place one by a dumpster? No. Did you ever record conversations by a rock where the staff members would go and sit? I believe I just said so the only place I placed one is in Lauren's locker. Because if I can play that audio, uh, all right, so I want to quickly let you guys know what the New Jersey recording laws are. That basically, uh, New Jersey recording law stipulates that it is a one party consent state. In New Jersey, 
It is a criminal offense to use any device to record or share communications without the consent of at least one person taking part in the communication. Again, all that means is that one party can decide to uh, record the other party. They don't need the other party's consent. Laura, correct me if I'm wrong, but in California, you need both parties' consent. And I'll, I'll follow that up with a question. Um, why do you think states would allow for recording with only one party consent? Uh, as you said, in California, it's two party state unless unless one of them is committing a crime, then you don't have to tell them that you're recording them. That is allowed. That's the exception. Uh, I, I'm not I, since I'm in California and I've always known it as a you know a two party uh, state. I would think that they are just giving people the ability to record people without the fear. Sometimes you don't really know when the person is going to commit the crime, and it gives you the opportunity to have the recordings and finally get the one where the person is let's say, extorting you or threatening you. Um, it just helps them get the evidence. I, I can't think of any other reason why they're doing it, honestly. Yeah, I agree. I guess that's some sort of deterrent in, in some way. I, I really don't know. It makes much more sense to have it be a two-party consent state for privacy reasons. Agreed. But, right? Does it? I mean, that's how I see it. All right, Laura, stand by. We're going to take a break. <clears throat> Excuse me. Coming up next, we're going to stay in New Jersey for the former Olympian attempted murder trial. The victim's fiancé, who witnesses to the, he witnesses the shooting, continues to tell the court about the near-fatal interaction, and it is our testimony of the day. And then later in our talkback segment, the fallout from the Will Smith Oscar slap continues. I want to know what you think. Should Will Smith have been forced to leave the ceremony after he refused to go? We'll share some of your comments later on in the show. Keep it right here on Court TV. Visit goodtogo.com. Hello, and welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Michael Ayala. Michael Barrison was a member of the 2008 Olympic team and the 1997 medal winning Nations Cup team in Hickstead, England. But now he is on trial for the attempted murder of Lauren Canarac and Robert Goodwin. Both Goodwin and Canarac have taken the stand to testify about the night of the incident. But Robert Goodwin faced cross examination earlier today. Defense attorney Edward Billinkis questioned Goodwin about the events leading up to the gunshots going off and the tumultuous relationship with Barrison. But at the end of the day, Goodwin says Barrison's attack was unprovoked. The cross-examination of Robert Goodwin is our testimony of the day. When did Lauren Cataract come outside? Well, I think she was behind me. Um, she said she'll, she'll go talk to him. She wanted to try to, I guess, work something out. When you say work something out. I don't know what it was in regards to. Would you agree with me that at that point she was pissed off before she even said anything to Barristan? Are you asking how I feel with Lauren's? No, I'm oh, asking what? you your observations of Lauren Cataract. Was she angry? No, she, she wanted to, I don't know what she was trying to work out. I mean, in my mind, there was nothing to work out, but she said, you know, she wanted to work something out. I guess she at least wanted to hear what he had to say. Did she casually walk down to talk to him or did she stomp her way towards him? She walked over to him. She came down the steps and walked over towards him. Okay, and you, did you go into the house? I stayed there on the porch watching the conversation or what? watching what I thought was going to be a conversation. So after the shooting, she didn't run up the stairs, open the door and yell to you not to come out. Can you say that again? Okay. After you talked to Michael Barrison and Lauren Cataract walked down the stairs to talk to Michael, did she, after that, walk up the stairs, open the door, and tell you don't come out? No. Were you present when she made her statement to the prosecutor's office? No. Did, did you talk to her about the events and what happened on that night prior to her giving the statement to the prosecutor? Did not. 
I know we, we've talked many times about the incident. It was a very life-changing incident, and unfortunately, I will never forget or get over. So, I mean, I don't, I don't understand. Did I coach her, are you saying? No, I don't I'm not, I'm not asking you're coaching her, but before she went to talk to the prosecutor and give her official version of the event... I don't think so. I was instructed, I think, not to... By who? By the police, I believe. When? I don't know. Warren was in the hospital for three weeks. Sometimes in that three weeks, I, I think I was told somewhere along the line not to discuss. Yeah. You know. And it's your, it's your testimony that <laughs> after she got out of the hospital uh, and came home, that you and her never talked about that day. What happened? Who did what? What each other's recollection was. I just said I'm, I'm not I'm not sure specifically what was talked about and when was talked about it, but it was a major life changing event that Lauren unfortunately will have to live with problems for the rest of her life because a man shot her two times unprovoked. Okay. Tried to kill me and her. All right, still with me, criminal defense attorney Laura Uretzi. And Laura, I don't want to get your uh, critique of that cross-examination. It was a consistent issue for me, just the lack of control of the witnesses. I mean, they were continually able to basically opine and say different things that would help their story. Um, I could see what the defense attorney was trying to do, trying to create this idea that maybe they corroborated and created a story between the two of them. But again, just too much freelancing there allowed by this witness. Uh, agreed, agreed. I mean, usually when we're cross-examining uh, a witness, we've got the story in our mind and it's the question is, you did this right, you did that right, this is what happened, correct? We're not giving them the opportunity to give us their own version. Okay, there are some times that we do, but a lot of times we're just, we're the narrators and it's our story that he or she is admitting to or not admitting to. Um, and, and, I, I, and you know, each attorney, they've got their own style and I'm not here to criticize what he's, what he's doing and each has their own style. Uh, but this witness, but unfortunately the, the defense attorney could not get him to admit something that's very common sense. Most likely they did speak about this and he was just being um, a witness that was not cooperative basically. Uh, and maybe the jury could see that and, and that could save the day for the defense. Yeah, I think that kind of came across the idea that it's obvious the two of them were in the same place for a period of time. They would have talked about this so quote unquote life changing event. Um, the other thing was, and I agree with you, this might have been part of the defense attorney's tactic. He did it with Lara, uh, Lauren, excuse me, Canarac as well by letting them talk he was giving the jury a sense of who they are and the type of people they are. And I think it was particularly effective if that was what he was doing with this witness. Because as he was going on and on and during the course of his cross-examination, I was like, gosh, I would hate to be in a situation where I would have to try to work something out with this guy. Just his, his body language, his attitude, all of it just feels wrong. Agreed. I mean, you could see the attitude and the way he was leaning back and, and it was almost like he was ready to fight of course not physically but uh and and that attitude the rolling of the eyes it's, it's, he's just he doesn't come across as sympathetic he, he comes across as someone who could have been the bully absolutely and he said he stood on the porch while the two of them talked I have trouble believing that. He doesn't seem like the kind of guy that's just going to sit, stand by on a porch <laughs> while his girl goes out and talks to this guy. So anyway. Agreed. Right? He just doesn't seem like that kind of guy. Yeah, I, I can't believe that. I can't buy that. Yeah, and he, he could obviously handle himself in a fight. He put the guy in a hole, broke his arm.